Happy New Year! It's our first program for 2024, a year which was ushered in with great pizzazz around the world. What you're seeing here is how some cities celebrated the dawning of a brand new year. And as we get ourselves settled into the year, our wish is that you have a fantastic year of hope, joy and opportunity. Welcome to Kaleidoscope where we are positive, daring, different and welcome to 2024. A huge thank you to our partners who have been with us through 2023 and now into 2024. Selico Life, CDB, The Daily Morning, Park Street Gourmet, Park Street Wines and Zip Zip. Kaleidoscope is on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And if you like our show, don't forget to subscribe and follow for weekly updates. CDB Hybrid Leasing. Enjoy exclusive interest rate and much more for hybrids, plug-in hybrids and EV vehicles. Now, for a quick look at the week that was on CDB Snapshot. Sri Lanka's headline inflation in December is 4%, up from November's 3.4%. December sees nearly 211,000 tourist arrivals, bringing 2023's total to 1.48 million tourists for the year. Sri Lanka Customs has a record revenue of 970 billion rupees in 2023. CNN names Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella CEO of the year. And scientists uncover an active underwater volcano covered in the eggs of a Pacific white skate. on your goals. We will take care of the risks. Silly go life. And welcome to Selinko Life News Capsule. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka released its financial stability review with expectations of a rebound in domestic demand and economic activity which will improve income levels, enhance purchasing power and stability in government securities thanks to an agreement being reached with the official creditor committee of China. While the continued advancement of the IMF EFF reforms is necessary, any deviation would bring about irreversible consequences to the financial system. The country's credit cycle is expected to enter an expansionary phase where macro prudential concerns could build up as well. They are probably the best tourism brand ambassador Sri Lanka could ever have. Chanel Rodrigo, a content creator, entrepreneur and social media brand ambassador for Sri Lanka Tourism Promotions Bureau and Shehan Tahir, the co-founder of Assault Creative, Sri Lanka's first boutique travel production house and brand manager for At Chanel, are amazing storytellers and their super unusual take on seemingly usual things in Sri Lanka make us all proud to be Sri Lankan. Given their infectious optimism, we asked them what their wish list is for 2024. I would really like to see, I think one thing is to see and hear more appreciation for Sri Lanka. I think, you know, we have such a beautiful country to call home and I'd love to see more positive thoughts and more uh, appreciation around the island. And everything it has to offer, as much as there is bad, yeah. Out there, I think a lot of people tend to miss out on the beauty that Sri Lanka has, uh, not just from a travel perspective, but also from its people, its food, uh, the culture. Cultural diversity, um, the diversity of climate, the environment, the nature, the people, the goodness that the people have to offer, all of that. Another one on our wish list is to see more Sri Lankans travel internally. Uh, rather than overseas. Uh, having travelled and spent a lot of time travelling locally, it's really opened our eyes to just how diverse the country is. And it's really helped us to get to know who Sri Lanka really is and what it really is than having um, media or even us tell you it's always better to go out there and see for yourself because the people, the experience you have with them, the environment, the change in environment, all of that 
uh, teaches you so much and you learn so much more history on the ground meeting people and there's a lot to be learned from the different kinds of people that you meet in different parts of Sri Lanka. Each one will show you a different way of seeing and appreciating the country and that perspective is immense. Yeah. Another one on my wish list is uh, hoping that more Sri Lankans start working into um, freelance and with, uh, you know, internationally as that has become available to more and more people this year, uh, whether it's in Jaffna or in the East Coast, we've met so many people or even in the South, we've met so many people who are working in remote jobs and doing really well for themselves whilst living in Sri Lanka. That will help curtail the brain drain that mm -hmm. we're seeing. Uh, there's a huge market for us to tap into and we're really excited to see more people tap into that market internationally. Yeah. And our final wish for everyone is peace, harmony and prosperity. We've had a really tough couple of years and I am hopeful that we'll have a really good couple of months going forward. Yes. And now for a look at our stock, oil and gold markets as we embark on a new year. At the Colombo Stock Exchange, the all share price index remained virtually static with average turnover levels remaining at a low of below 1 billion rupees per day. Oil prices remained low at 75 to 76 US dollars per barrel on reduced demand. After moving up by 13% in 2023, expected lower US interest rates have seen gold prices holding steady above 2050 US dollars per ounce. Louis Vuitton is branching out into hospitality. An entire hotel on the Champs-Élysées, 6,000 square meters and dazzling in silver and glass motifs of its famed logo. And let's talk this week, it's all about cricket and cricket seen through the lens of a British writer. Nicholas Brooks will be at the Gold Literary Festival this month. He will be chatting about his book, An Island's Eleven, the story of Sri Lankan cricket, which has been called the Cricket Book of the Year. Nicholas is obviously a die-hard cricket fan, like all of us, and cricket is more than just a sport for him. Tim Wigmore, in fact, called Nicholas's book an essential addition to cricket literature. Safe to say, Nicholas's book hit a sixer. Today, we catch up with Nicholas Brooks from his home in South London for more insights on this gentleman's game and, of course, his book. Welcome, Nicholas. What led you to write An Island's Eleven? Uh, I was a huge fan of Sri Lanka growing up in the 90s when the team was on top of the world and it seemed to me as a kid as though they'd always been kind of a part of cricket's furniture. And it was only when I grew into adulthood that I realized that they only got test status in the early 80s and that before that, there was kind of a long history which had really been forgotten, underexplored. And actually, I mean, going to the library at Lords was amazing. I mean, they've got a treasure trove of books about cricket and every other test playing nation had columns and columns. And then I got to the Sri Lanka section and it was absolutely tiny, you know, it was sort of six or seven books. And so I realized that there was a gap and that Sri Lankan history needed to be sort of better explored. And then when I started digging into it, I just grew increasingly fascinated. So it was something that I wanted to do straight away to kind of capture everything that I could. What challenges did you face when you were writing this book? My original plan was just to take short trips to Sri Lanka, do interviews and then come back home and write it here, which I quickly realized was going to be impossible because uh, I think to write a book like this, you really have to kind of immerse yourself in the culture of a place. And for me, trying to understand, trying to insinu insinuate myself into Sri Lankan culture and Sri Lankan life was really important. And so uh, I figured out a way to do that, which was by teaching at St. Thomas's in Mount Lavinia, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, they agreed to kind of give me a flat on campus and give me my meals in exchange for teaching English, which was just an amazing experience because the school has such a rich cricketing heritage. As a fairly unknown writer, trying to approach cricketers, administrators, constantly convincing them uh, that this was a real thing, that it was a valid project, that it was worth them taking up their time 
to contribute to. And I was incredibly lucky uh, that I received so much kindness from Sri Lankan players and Sri Lankan former players, journalists, people who are in the know about cricket. But it's a huge project when you're looking at 170 years of cricket history and you're trying to condense that into a sort of, you know, a readable book while keeping hold of a narrative thread. So, you know, it was my first book. It was a learning process, uh, but it was uh, absolutely fascinating. So what are the, some of the gems in your book that you'd like to share with us? I mean, going right back to the whistle stops, how the early uh, teams travelling to the Ashes from England or Australia would stop in Colombo and play a one-day game. And so, you know, going right back to the... 1880s, uh, you have these teams of Salon players playing against some of the greats, you know, from cricketing history, guys like W.G. Grace, uh, Don Bradman, Jack Hobbs, you know, Keith Miller, all these kind of uh, really marquee names who in many cases didn't play in, uh, you know, lots of countries, but all of them stopped over in Colombo and had a game there. What is it about Sri Lankan cricket that drew you in? I loved Sri Lanka as a team from when I was a kid, uh, you know, in the late 90s, the early 2000s, uh, there were so many just incredible figures in Sri Lankan cricket from, you know, Arjuna Ranatunga, Aravinda the Silva, Sanath Jaisariya, Murali, uh, these guys, you know, and then you had Sangakara, Jayawardena, uh, Dilshan, all these incredible cricketers coming through. And as a kid, there was something sort of uh, I want to say almost mythical, almost larger than life about the Sri Lankan team. You know, these guys with these hugely long names that I couldn't pronounce, but who seemed to play cricket in a different way. They had such a cavalier style. So there was something about South Asia's passion for the game, which doesn't really exist in England. You know, you do find some people who are cricket aficionados and who love it. But I think that kind of all-encompassing uh, obsession with cricket is something which you really only find in South Asia. It's the new year and it's about new beginnings new places and new spaces and that's what 2024 is going to be all about and i am here at harpo's new space shoulders by harpo at the havelock city mall i thought i'd pop in and have a chat with the people who are behind the scenes here ashira and shehan gomez gives us a heads up about shoulders shoulders uh, was actually the name was created by harpo because he's been rubbing shoulders with everyone in the industry and mm -hmm. uh, all his customers for the past 40 years. The place is so tiny that you literally have to rub shoulders. The kitchen, yeah. behind the bar, like you're literally rubbing shoulders. And even shoulders. the customers. Even you're... the customers. The ambience is comfy and cosy and the menu is all about Greek-inspired local produce. So our chef Shehan Setunga uh, studied in uh, Malaysia with us and then went on to Australia mm -hmm. where he became the head chef of a few top restaurants in Melbourne mm -hmm. and he used his knowledge on Greek inspiration, inspir inspired food to bring it to our, our doorstep here. Plus our charcoal fire grill was custom built for mm -hmm. our restaurant yes. uh, where we cook our meats over a long period of time to make sure they're juicy and you know up to the standard that we have set. We are going to do a few changes to our menu. We're going to increase our lunch offering. Mm -hmm. And basically make this entire place like a beer garden because this is a really nice place to just come on a Saturday and Sunday yeah. to just relax, have your beers, have good food. And so, Havelock City is so centrally located yeah, that, so you know, it's, perfect. <laughs> uh, it's the perfect place to do it. So hop on over to Shoulders in the new year and rub shoulders with some great folks. We will see you next week.